So Pietro Valdastri is a um, world-renowned expert in um, medical robotics and in particular interested in colonoscopy. He started uh, at um, in Pisa, near Pisa, SSSA, um, PhD under Paolo Dario, is that, is that correct? Yep, yep, yep. And then uh, went to um, Vanderbilt University in the States and was there for five, six years and uh, developed his team there and then moved that team and expanded, of course, on that to the University of Leeds here uh, in the UK. And um, yeah, it's, it's nice that you are here again. You also gave a presentation, fantastic presentation last year. And, um, and I think I said already last year, but I think it's good to repeat what I really what I really find fascinating about you is that you, you do your you know, top range research, but at the same time, you also look at commercialization and you are in the process of um, setting up yeah. big deals with, with companies to actually yeah. um, um, commercialize your, your colonoscopic uh, magnetic colonoscopy system. Yeah. And um, I suppose that's something you're going to talk about today. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Kaspar, for the invitation, for the nice presentation. It's it's always a pleasure. Last year I came in person, but in the end the talk was uh, online. So, <laughs> but it was great to 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 see around, uh, and uh, um, and so yeah. Today I'm talking to you about mainly robotic colonoscopy, and uh, but I will start uh, with discussing a little bit of autonomy in surgical robotics and medical robotics. And I'll discuss that by pointing at a, a paper that was published on science robotics uh, a few months ago. <clears throat> and this paper was uh, is basically a review of uh, work carried on from 2010 to 2020 in different fields of medical robotics, including uh, a standard uh, laparoscopic robot like the intuitive surgical Da Vinci robot, but also rehabilitation, so exoskeletons, prosthesis, um, as well as continuum robots and capsule robots. And so in particular, I curated uh, the chapter on capsule robots and this, this review paper tries to um, underline what are the main five, six most relevant papers that were published in the last decade in those different fields. Beyond this, uh, this review paper also comments on autonomy in medical robotics. Uh, inspired by uh, an editorial that appeared in 2017 on Science Robotics, <clears throat> it is possible to define different level of autonomy which is basically computer assistant, assistance uh, in uh, medical robotic and surgical robotics. And this is inspired from the field of automotive, <clears throat> where, for example, uh, there are st standard uh, old fashioned car that have no autonomy. So the driver is in command and decide where the car is going uh, up to what we are now used today, uh, cars that can self park, uh, or can uh, assist driving uh, up to autonomous driving. And so these this different levels of autonomy that you see here from no autonomy le level zero, increasing to full automation is something inspired from the field of automotive that research in surgical robotics and medical robotics is trying to apply to the platform under uh, platforms under development. Of course, the intuitive surgical Da Vinci robot, which I hope you are familiar with. Um, if not, let me know. I have slides uh, on that, but uh, uh, otherwise I won't, uh, I won't touch that. But just to mention that it has no autonomy. So basically what the user is doing on the master, on the, on the user interface, is transparently mapped to the instruments uh, with virtually no delay. Uh, and so the user is in, in full control of what is happening. Um, but research is trying to basically build on top of this uh, with different level of computer assistance. And let me give you some example in the field of surgical robotics. Uh, and then I'll discuss about our research in robotic colonoscopy. And also in that case, we try to uh, 
increase the level of computer assistance along this paradigm of different level of autonomy. But now let's focus on surgical robotics. This is work uh, uh, from uh, the group of Blake Arnaford at the University of Washington. Here, this is the first level, so robotic assistance. So in this case, um, the system recognized that in the workspace has appeared um, a, a delicate object. And so while at the beginning the instrument can go down uh, to the bottom, once uh, a delicate object is introduced in the scene, the, 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 the slave, the, the, the end effector is limited in his workspace in order to avoid uh, the target. And so if you think about um, uh, real surgery, it is possible to define areas where there is sensitive anatomy, maybe, uh, that are off limits for the end effector of the robot. And so even if the user is trying to go there, the robot will not, the robotic system will not allow. Uh, so very basic uh, uh, level of robot assistance. Then we can have a second level of task autonomy. This is the uh, Berkeley University work on different uh, the automation of different tasks. The first one is palpation, so basically reconstructing a mechanical stiffness map of the tissue, identifying a stiffer area, and then using a scalper to cut around there. And then uh, in this case with um, the instrument removing the 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 lamp the so the stiffer part and then closing the suture with with uh, glue so automation of different tasks uh, as an example another example uh, that was published on sensitive rational medicine about uh, six years ago uh, by the group of axel krieger uh, who uh, is um, now at Johns Hopkins, um, is about autonomous suturing. Uh, so basically, um, the system identifies where stitches need to go and perform suture in an autonomous fashion. Of course, in this case, there is some help from a human operator, but where to deploy the stitches and how to approach the target is all automated. <laughs> and this is possible thanks to an advanced vision system combined with a purposely designed um, stitching tool. So you see here the advanced vision system that take advantage of fluorescent, fluorescent markers and is able to reconstruct uh, and, uh, uh, the trajectory and plan the motion of, of the robot. And so this is automating uh, uh, a specific task of suturing. Okay, so this is a sort of introduction for different level of autonomy in surgical robotics, state of the art. Now I will uh, uh, present one slide with the activities that we have in my lab at the University of Leeds, and then we will focus on robotic colonoscopy and explore different levels of autonomy that we can reach in that field. So my lab is called STORM, uh, that stands for Science and Technologies of Robotics in Medicine. And uh, we have um, one big area on robotic endoscopy uh, where uh, uh, we are trying to enable earlier diagnosis of colorectal cancer with a platform that is designed to replace colonoscopy. And today I'll talk about this uh, in detail. Um, then we are also uh, in designing ultra low cost flexible endoscope to be uh, portable and used in rural areas of low income countries. Um, we also have a um, fully operational Da Vinci uh, robot from Intuitive Surgical and we have a DVRK Da Vinci research kit and we use um, we use it to uh, try to automate part of the procedure. Uh, in particular, we have uh, some work on automating uh, tissue retraction with one of the three uh, instrument arms of the Da Vinci, while the other two are used by the doctor to operate underneath. So automated tissue retraction, basically. We are also working with collaborators at Glasgow and Warwick uh, on uh, uh, advanced imaging uh, uh, 
technologies to improve autonomy in surgical robotics, particularly using ultrasound and terahertz, terahertz radiation. And then we have a last line of research, more uh, recent, uh, uh, about magnetic tentacle robots. So these are soft robots embedded with magnetic particles and magnetized in a personalized fashion to uh, basically enter deep inside the body of a patient uh, in, uh, and, and have full, full shape control on the catheter. And this is something that is funded by the ERC uh, and started uh, uh, around 2019. Um, okay, but today I'll focus on uh, uh, robotic colonoscopy. If you are interested in these other areas, just uh, let me know and uh, I'll be happy to discuss more about those. You can also find everything on my uh, lab website. Uh, okay, robotic colonoscopy. So why is that important? So uh, it's important because of colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer is cancer happening in the colon, and the colon is the last part of the gastrointestinal tract. So this 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 part here. Um, colorectal cancer is the second uh, uh, most important killer in terms of cancer, uh, only after lung cancer. Um, but interestingly, uh, colorectal cancer progresses from stage zero to stage four in about five to 10 years. And if it is detected uh, at, stage, at an early stage when it is not symptomatic, uh, then it can, it, it can be um, treated and removed successfully um, via polypectomy. So basically it can be removed by cutting the tissue uh, so removing the polyp, so this is called polyp typically. So if, it, if the polyp is removed at an early stage, then the five-year survival rate is about 100% or 90%. So it's, it's very high. Um, on the other hand, if cancer is detected at a late stage, uh, when it becomes symptomatic, and so pain in, in the tummy and also blood in the feces, uh, if it's detected at this point where it has already spread to other organs, then surgery is needed, uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy are also uh, possibly needed. But in this case, the five-year survival rate drops to 11%. So it is really important to find colorectal cancer at an early stage. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not uh, symptomatic, so there is no external evidence that cancer is growing. And for this reason, screening is really important. So in the US before May 2021, the recommendation was to get um, a screening colonoscopy uh, at the year uh, at 50 years of age. Now from May 2021, uh, the recommendation has dropped to 45 years of age. So once a person turned 45 is invited uh, at, to, to attend the colonoscopy, uh, which is refunded by insurance. If nothing is uh, discovered, then the next colonoscopy is in three to five years. If something is discovered, then it's treated, and then colonoscopy is about every year. Of course, if someone has a family history of colorectal cancer, then colonoscopy screening starts earlier. And this is the US. Similar in Australia, uh, so also in Australia, the, the screening starts at 45. Here in the UK, uh, here in England, bowel cancer screening starts at 50. And it's, it has already improved. Before it was starting at 55, 60. Now it starts at 50. Um, the, the issue in the UK is that, as you, as you know, NHS is, uh, is always... Uh, in, um, extremely constrained and, and stressed out. And so um, here we screen with fecal blood test. It would have been impossible to screen with, with uh, uh, colonoscopies because of the number of available uh, gastroenterologists and facilities. And so we screen with fecal blood test. And if the fecal blood test is positive, then the patient gets a colonoscopy. But again, another interesting thing is that the threshold of how positive is the fecal blood test to request a colonoscopy 
in the in, in England is not set by clinical studies, but it's set of out of capacity. So we know that NHS has the capacity to do one million colonoscopies every year, and uh, this number is mapped mapped back on the um, the outcome of uh, of bowel cancer uh, uh, test, the fecal blood test, and so. Is mapped in a way that only one million get a colonoscopy. Only the the the, the one million patients that have the worst uh, level of uh, blood in the feces. So there is a clear need of more colonoscopies in England, but also in the US where they are very organized. Uh, and uh, yeah. of course, uh, yeah. Sorry for interrupting. I I was just told uh, I think yeah. yesterday that uh, the the fecal testing, the stool test starts only when you are 60 years old. In the yeah, <coughs> well, this was a BBC News in August. Uh, maybe they have, uh, this, maybe this, I should update this. This then. is 2018, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, so I, they I, rolled I, back to 60 then. That's, yeah. Okay. And, that, and then to start with a stool test, not to offer a colonoscopy, of course. And only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is, this was like also a stool test. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Good. So That's back to I'm 60. Told. Okay, but well, this told. goes again back to the, the problem is capacity. In in England, the problem is capacity. So the point, uh, I guess, the rationale be behind going back to 60 is that colonoscopy is so limited that you don't want to have too many colonoscopies. And so if you start screening at 50, you you'll get a lot of a lot more of colonoscopies. So yeah, it is a big issue. And uh, in the US as well, now in the US, uh, before May 2021, they had 15 million colonoscopies every year. Uh, and now if dropping by five years, the eligible age, it's four, more, four million more people are eligible for colonoscopy. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a huge demand for colonoscopy. But now let's have a look about at, at colonoscopy itself. What, what is colonoscopy? So colonoscopy is done with an instrument called flexible endoscope or colonoscope, which is a 1.5 meter long tube with a camera at the tip. Uh, of course, light to illuminate. There is an irrigation nozzle to uh, squirt water on the camera and clean it, but also this irrigation nozzle can be used to insufflate the lumen with uh, air or CO2, because of course the colon is collapsed, but you want to have an image like this one here, so you need to insufflate, create space to look around. Um, also, uh, there are cables, Bowden cables running through the length of the device, and those cables are connected to two knobs, and those allow to move the camera left, right, up, and down uh, by basically rotating those two knobs. Uh, and here, I just want to focus your attention on the user interface. So you see basically uh, the, the, the user has one end to push and pull, uh, the right end typically, and the left end is used to control this user interface where uh, there are uh, um, buttons for insufflation, irrigation, so flushing water, but also the two wheels to orient uh, the camera. And those two wheels are, are manipulated by the thumb, so it's, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, the instrument also has an instrument channel, uh, and the instrument channel can be used to pass uh, standard uh, um, endoscopy instruments. In this case, for example, is a biopsy forceps to, to get tissue samples. This one here is a snare to uh, cut a polyp, but there are many other different uh, instruments that can be used. And, and basically, it's, they are introduced from an opening here, they travel <clears throat> through the length of the endoscope, reach the tip and come out from the instrument channel. Now, um, colonoscopy is a well-established procedure, um, but it has a lot of limitation. And all the limitations are related to the poor design of the flexible endoscope. So the design of the flexible endoscope dates back 1957. At that time, uh, um, 
the video, the, the image, the image was provided by a bundle of optical fibers. So the, the doctor had to look inside an ocular and uh, um, to, to look inside the body. Nowadays, we have uh, uh, high resolution, chip on tip cameras with CCD or CMOS technology. So we have very, very um, high resolution, high quality, high fidelity image. Um, and we, of course, don't need to look inside uh, the instrument, but we have nice projection on an LCD screen. Um, so imaging has improved big time. The, the mechanical design of the instrument has remained the same. So and the principle of having to uh, push a tube inside a convoluted anatomy is, remains the same. And so you see here, pushing the instrument through an anatomy that is not straight basically entails that the instrument has to stretch the tissue to advance. So there is no way to, to avoid this tissue stretching uh, whenever there is a, a, a band. So there is a band here, there is a band here, and of course there is a third band here. And so every time there is a band, uh, the, the, the instrument is basically pressing on the band to advance. And so this stretching of the tissue creates pain because pain in the colon is associated with stretching and insufflation. And so this is extremely painful and also has high risk of perforation of the colon. And so typically the procedure is so painful that is performed under deep sedation, especially in the US is done under full anesthesia. So the patient is knocked out completely. Uh, and this is good for the patient in a sense that doesn't uh, the patient doesn't feel anything, but there is a big there are two big downsides. So first of all, full anesthesia is very dangerous because it has high risk of um, cardiovascular uh, side effects, uh, and also it's very expensive because you need uh, an anesthesiologist in the room and anesthesia monitoring. So all the equipment uh, uh, for that. Uh, he, here in the UK. Colonoscopy is performed under uh, uh, conscious sedation, so the patient is still conscious. The downside of this is that there is a very high number of incomplete colonoscopies, meaning that uh, the, 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 patient say, the patient asks the doctor to stop before the endoscope has reached the cecum. And so uh, due to pain, uh, the procedure is interrupted, and so the there, there is a part that is not explored, typically the cecum, this final part. And so if polyps or cancer are here, they are not detected. And so very high level of incomplete colonoscopy is due to pain. So pain, big issue. Another big issue of colonoscopy is that the user interface, as I was mentioning before, is highly un unintuitive. And so long training is required to become proficient with colonoscopy. <clears throat> and, uh, and so that results also in a shortage of gastroenterologists that are able to do a colonoscopy. And alter, another interesting uh, aspect of, of the user interface too, actually, two other interesting aspects are, number one, the, the user interface has been designed with male and in mind. And so I had a guest visiting a female guest visiting the other day and I gave her uh, a flexible endoscope and she wasn't able to close her end around the handle because she just have a small end. Uh, and so and so there is uh, um, there is a bias towards men in gastro gastroenterology and in the design of the flexible endoscope. And last uh, this user interface is <coughs> The ergonomic is so poor that after years of uh, practicing, gastroenterologists typically have uh, issues at the ligament of the wrist. And, uh, and so um, the, 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 the useful lifetime of a gastroenterologist is shortened by poor ergonomics of the user interface. Um, Last but not least, the instrument is extremely expensive. Uh, so uh, a flexible endoscope like this uh, is about 60 to 70,000 pounds. For this reason, uh, it cannot be disposable, but need to be reused. 
uh, and it needs to be clean in between cases. And to clean it, uh, uh, we need uh, specific machines that perform basically um, uh, cycles with chemicals, temperature and high pressure, like like a dishwasher, basically. Uh, but those machines are very expensive and they are typically only in hospitals or large endoscopy center. And this limit the availability of colonoscopy to, to main, main hospital, main hospital uh, ups. And this can be an issue for uh, rural areas, uh, especially in the US where, I mean, big land, large land, and so people have to travel four hours to get to uh, a center for a colonoscopy. So it would be great to have something painless, intuitive to use, and possibly uh, not requiring reprocessing so that colonoscopy can be available in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in rural center or like community centers. And so, of course, in the years, uh, there have been a lot of different design of robotic colonoscope trying to address some of these issues. Um, and so this is a review paper uh, that was published recently, if you are interested in the topic. Um, out of all these uh, flexible robotic colonoscope, I would mention only this one is um, available in hospitals. So this is uh, the Endotics uh, robot, uh, startup from Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. <clears throat> and this is FDA approved, C marked, uh, and it works like an inchworm. Uh, so inchworm locomotion, so very uh, painless. So pain is eliminated. The downside of this approach, unfortunately, is that it takes quite some time to reach the end of the colon, and so it's about 30 minutes, and that is too long for a colonoscopy, unfortunately. So it is available, but it's not replacing uh, conventional colonoscopy by any means. Okay, now uh, let me introduce the, the, the solution that we are pursuing, and so this is a solution that I've been started working on about 13 years ago, so it's, it's been a long journey, uh, and it's based on magnetic manipulation. So we have a permanent magnet at the end effector of a robot and a permanent magnet inside the tip of the flexible endoscope. Uh, and so the idea is no more to push a pretty stiff tube inside the body, but rather to apply force and torque by magnetic field directly at the tip where is needed. And so this allow us to have a much more limited force and torque transfer and be gentle with, with the surrounding uh, tissue. Uh, we also don't need uh, cables to steer the tip because we can steer the tip by magnetic coupling. And so the, 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 the device that we have designed has the same capabilities of a flexible endoscope. So it has, uh, um, irrigation, insufflation, also an uh, instrument channel for uh, conventional laparoscopic instrument. But the fact that we have uh, magnetic propulsion and also magnetic orientation allow the body of the device to be extremely, <coughs> extremely flexible. And so you see here, compared to a uh, flexible endoscope, it's much more, much more pliable and much more gentle to, to the tissue. Um, thanks to robotics, we hope to make it also intuitive uh, for the user to drive. And in terms of cost, uh, the main cost of the flexible endoscope is the camera. And so if we are able to source an ultra low cost camera uh, for about 50 pounds, then the, the, the bill of material to, to, to uh, build this flexible endoscope is no more than 100 pounds, really. And so we can make it, dis we can make it disposable, uh, and so no need for reprocessing. Now, uh, of course, this is based on magnetic manipulation. Uh, and so this is the only uh, slide with some math, but 
at least one. Please allow me at least one slide with some math. Um, so here you see the external magnet, the magnet that we have at the end effector of the robot. And this is this small magnet is the magnet that we have at the tip of the flexible endoscope. Um, and you see here the field lines, uh, the, in black the field lines of the external magnet and in blue uh, the, uh, the field lines of the internal magnet. So the force that we can apply on the tip of the magnetic endoscope is um, proportional to the gradient of the external magnet. Um, and so how basically the field generated by the external magnet changes in space, while the torque is proportional to the misalignment of the two fields. Uh, and so by controlling the position of the external magnet, we can both apply force proportional to gradient and torque proportional to the misalignment. Um, but you may already guess that knowing the position of the internal magnet is crucial if we want to have precise control of, of forces and torques because the fields are so nonlinear in space that it would be impossible to predict how to move the external magnet without knowledge of of the internal magnet position. And so with this, I basically gave away the reason why a first study that we did in 2013 was a sort of failure. So in this study, what we were doing was to control with the joystick the external magnet and working under the assumption that if we were insufflating the colon, and so here we were using a porcine colon in a human anatomy uh, simulator. So if we were insufflating, we were creating space, then the idea was that if we just move the external magnet, the tip of the flexible endoscope would just follow. And this was true most of the cases, but there were many occasions where uh, due to the friction of the tether, the tip was not moving in, in the direction we wanted. And so we had to understand that magnetic coupling was not more robust just by looking at the image coming from the camera. And so if basically the external magnet was moving, but the image was not moving, that then the user had to move the external magnet back, try to re-engage the magnetic coupling and try to move in a different direction. And so this was frustrating for the user and resulted in the robotic procedure being three times lower than conventional colonoscopy, which was unacceptable from a clinical standpoint. And so we basically had to um, study a way to enable real time post detection. So we really needed to know in real time where the tip of the endoscope was inside the body of the patient. And we needed to know position and orientation uh, because only with these six degrees of freedom in localization, we were able to, un to, to predict how to move the external magnet to get the motion that we wanted. And so the core of our technology is a real time localization that is based on six magnetic field sensors that are integrated in the tip of the endoscope together with an accelerometer that we use as an inclinometer. And uh, the idea is that uh, this magnetic field sensor measure the field generated by the external magnet at the tip of the endoscope. Then once we have such a vector, we rotate it using the accelerometer as an inclinometer and we rotate it in, in the same reference frame as the external magnet. And then we do a search in a pre-calculated uh, magnetic field map to find the position the tip should have to um, measure that, that field. And so this approach works quite well with a refresh rate of one kilohertz in a workspace that is about a cube with a side of 30 centimeter. Um, and here you see a demonstration of that. We also have, you can also see a coil here because the approach I mentioned works everywhere but in, a, but in the central plane. So the central plane perpendicular to the main axis of, of the magnet, there the magnetic field generated by the permanent magnet is the same everywhere. And so it's a singularity plane for our localization. And so for this reason, we had to introduce a coil 
that is perpendicular. So this coil generates a field that is perpendicular to the permanent magnet and is different everywhere in the singularity plane. And so basically by looking at both those fields, one is steady state and one is uh, 200 Hertz, then we are able to uh, find position and attention of the tip everywhere in the workspace. And once we have position and attention of the tip with respect to the external magnet, we are also able to predict the intermagnetic force, which is also the force that the probe is applying on tissue. And so we can also monitor uh, that that stays below a safety threshold. Um, now that we have this uh, crucial part that is uh, real time localization, we were able to explore different level of, levels of autonomy, as I mentioned in my first slide. So. The first level is robotic assistance. So in this case, uh, the user control with the joystick the position and orientation of the tip of, of the tip of the endoscope just by looking at the camera. And so the joystick is referred to the um, reference frame of the camera at the tip of the endoscope. So forward, backward, left and right are referred to the image. Uh, how to move the external magnet to move forward with respect to the image frame is computed by the system, knowing, of course, position orientation of the tip of the endoscope. And so this way we had 10 non-expert users, including myself, doing five repetitions uh, uh, each of a colonoscopy in a uh, simulator, in a training simulator, and we all had 100% of success completing the colonoscopy in less than four minutes, which is compatible with standard colonoscopy. Um, then we automated uh, retroflexion. So this is task autonomy. Uh, so here we automated the task of retroflexion. That means from looking forward to looking backwards. Uh, and uh, uh, this is important because sometimes polyp can be hidden behind tissue folds and uh, conventional colonoscope cannot retroflect in the colon, only, only in the rectum, only in the first part. And so you see here, basically, we push a button and the system uh, localizes the tip of the endoscope and decides how to move the external magnet to achieve retroflexion. And retroflexion is achieved uh, in a very short amount of time, so compatible with the time of a procedure. Then we automated the biopsy targeting. Uh, and so here uh, uh, the user, the, the platform can be switched in a um, diagnostic mode. Once the tip has reached the end, the user can just pull the tether and retrieve the camera and while doing so it's possible to explore around and in this modality the magnet is following the tip of the endoscope just thanks again thanks to localization if a target is uh, located by an algorithm uh, that can run on top of of the camera so an ai algorithm uh, to detect uh, polyps for example if something is detected then the the, the tip can look at the target from two different angles, uh, reconstruct the distance from the endoscope tip to the target, and, uh, and then it's possible for the system to align the point where an instrument would come out from the instrument channel to the target. And once those two are aligned, then the user can use the biopsy forcep, for example, while the system is basically <coughs> maintaining stable control in closed loop. Um, and then uh, the uh, highest level of automation, autonomous colonoscopy. So in this case, we can run a uh, uh, um, lumen detection algorithm that is basically finding uh, the center of the lumen just by looking at uh, features like uh, like those round shape uh, features that we have in the column. And basically once the center of the lumen is identified, the system is just moving the tip in that direction. And so what the user is left to do in this case is just feeding the tether, as you can see here. And again, 10 users, five repetition each, 100% of success in reaching the end of the column in about four minutes. Then, of 
courts, we repeated this experience in animal uh, to confirm that uh, everything was working fine. So this is one animal trial we did about some, some years ago. Um, and here you see autonomous, autonomous colonoscopy with lumen detection. And this is the trajectory that we were able to, to navigate. And you see very convoluted trajectory. Um, and, and, and the fact that thanks to localization, we can also track the trajectory would also allow us to reconstruct the colon, <clears throat> basically stitching the images and coordinating them with position. Uh, we would be able to reconstruct the colon in 3D. And that would be really important because we can show to the user, to the gastroenterologist, if all the colon has been explored. Uh, because it's very, very often happens that some part of the colon are not visualized, and maybe in that part there are polyps, and so the colonoscopy cannot be really, uh, the, 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 the outcome of the procedure cannot be 100% sure that no polyp was, was left behind. And so with a technology like this, where we can reconstruct the colon, we can also spot if there were regions that were not explored and tell the user to go in, in that in those areas. Now, if you can stop recording, I will go with the... We'll go. Um, I just want to also remind you, we're already at 10.48. Oh, yes, I know, I know. I, I, I was... Yep, thanks. So Support this me. is how the... Got it, yeah. So this is how the platform looks like today, and as you have seen in the video, so a medical grade, design of the cart and the monitor. So this is ready to go into human trials that we are pursuing in Leeds and at Vanderbilt University. And I see a bright future integrating robotics with AI. There are already system in the market that can detect polyps that are commercially available, FDI approved. Uh, and it's very easy to integrate them to robotic platform and also get additional features like 3D colon reconstruction. And so all this should make, in the end, colonoscopy more available, so increase availability, making colonoscopy easier to perform, painless, uh, operator independent and more autonomous. And hopefully detecting more cancers uh, at an early stage, treating them and saving lives. And so. With this, uh, uh, I will I will conclude by uh, thanking all the sponsors and all my team, and glad to get some questions. At least five minutes of questions. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Fantastic, really, really excellent. Really happy to that you gave all this this, this overview, also the the background at the at the beginning to really show the need for new ways of doing a colonoscopy. So, um, yeah, uh, no, no problem that you spoke a bit longer. I think you give a fantastic overview. So Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for that. But yeah, we have a few minutes. Um, Alberto Arezzo will be actually the next speaker, uh, but he's not here yet. So let's make good use of that time. Um, anyone with a question, please raise your hand or open your microphone. And since that is not happening straight away, I'll just shoot with some questions from my side. So you're saying it's pain free or the, the pain is reduced, but how do you know? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, of course, pain is subjective. And so we did a lot of animal trials, but we were not able to ask the pig <laughs> for several <laughs> exactly. reasons. Exactly. Um, certainly, we have measured the forces uh, on on the phantom simulators, on the plastic simulators, and then we can certainly see that the forces we are applying are 10, if not 100 times lower than uh, conventional colonoscopy. Of course, conventional colonoscopy also depends on the person performing uh, the procedure. So. If you speak with our with best gastroenterologists, they'd say they have uh, light touch, their patient do not feel any pain. And that's probably true. But the point is that we want to democratize colonoscopy. And so making sure that every patient has the same pain free experience. And so we would like to guarantee this for all the operators. And uh, but I mean, to answer your question, we need human trials to answer. 
de definitely to, to the question. We have good hopes because farts and talks and interaction with tissue, we, we have measured it's, it's 10 to 100 times less, but uh, yeah, we'll see. When will you? When, when do you think you will have the first uh, human trial? So the the we we have all the documentation ready. So we submitted to MHRA, and they they, they the process is is quite involved. So basically, they would like us to have an external company coming and doing a lot of biocompatibility tests, and this is quite expensive. In parallel, we have submitted the same paperwork to uh, the local ethical committee at Vanderbilt University, and looks like they they are more keen to approve it without an external company coming for test, but just just uh, taking uh, on board uh, our tests. And so we'd see at the moment we are hoping to have a green light from Vanderbilt and do the test in the US in early early next year. Uh, if if that doesn't work, then we roll back to MHRA and uh, yeah, we need to hire an external company coming from test, which is about 30 to 50 K, a thousand pounds. So yeah, we're trying to to so we are we believe we are 100% sure the platform is safe so we are confident we can go on in humans it's just like bureaucracy red tape uh, and uh, regulations yeah i mean you, you need to it needs to be properly certified because at the end of the day you you want to apply it to humans and you don't want to yeah. Too, too, too many in the process so <laughs> there's, a, there's a question in the room fantastic yeah, yeah. A good question, I think. I just repeat that to you, um, whether yes, metal, metal implants would be an issue, yeah. whether that would be, yes. especially with your magnetic approach. Yeah, 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 absolutely. At the moment, uh, for recruiting passion, we have the same uh, exclusion criteria than magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI. So with metallic implant, uh, the passion is not eligible for, for this procedure. For two reasons. One is, of course, attraction of of the magnetic implant, but there is also disturbance to localization. So if there is something metallic in 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 the workspace, then localization is uh, uh, affected. And so that's that's a limitation. But we see that new implants are more and more MRI compatible, <laughs> and so we believe that in the future everyone with an implant would also be eligible for our procedure because uh, yeah is where the field of implants is going is is towards mri compatibility very good and uh, there is another question now online which is very similar actually i mean same same area so when a patient has a pacemaker does the magnetic yeah. field interfere with that so I yeah 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 that applies there yeah it's basically the same answer uh interestingly for for fulfilling uh, uh, medical regulation, we need also to measure and uh, clearly indicate the pacemaker line. So the pacemaker line is basically a line where uh, the magnetic field drops, is a line uh, away from the source of magnetic field, where the magnetic field drops to a level that is safe for a pacemaker. And if you look at our external permanent magnet, the pacemaker line is quite close because the field decays so rapidly that that it is quite uh, it is quite uh, small around the external magnet. So ideally, we should be able to do a procedure on someone with a pacemaker because the art is away from the colon and so it's feasible of course it would be an additional degree of complication so we would avoid initially patient with pacemakers but eventually it, it may be possible very good um so you you spoke about uh, the, the safety that needs to be checked for the the yeah. device you want to be you want to put inside the body you spoke about biocompatibility yeah and you're working on that, but what about the safety um, on the outside? Because I saw you have a huge magnet and it's yeah. getting big, bigger and bigger, I have the feeling, and then yeah. a big robot arm moves these magnets around. What about safety yeah. issues there? 
So the magnetic safety is safe by design in a sense that the, the magnet has a cover and the cover is designed in with a with a specific thickness that even if you go against the cover with the tip of the flexible endoscope, the force would not be harmful. So it is safe by design. Okay. So it is able to lift the tip of the endoscope, but even if you get it as close as possible to the magnet, the pinching pressure in between the two magnets is not enough to do any damage. Uh, and so uh, the safe by design approach is also the key, in our opinion, to eventually get approval for autonomous colonoscopy. Because if it's safe by design, it cannot harm. So even if it's controlled by artificial intelligence, uh, it shouldn't be any issue from a safety perspective. In terms of the robot arm, uh, we, we, uh, we have selected uh, KUHA LBR MED, which is fully certified to be used in an operating room with uh, redundant encoders, safety brakes, uh, uh, and all it, it fulfill all the um, safety regulation described by the relevant standards. And at the end of the day, what the regulator looks uh, at are standards and compliance with standards. And so we have designed all the platform to comply with, with all standards. Which is a painful process, painful and extremely long process, but uh, yep. it's doable. It's, it's the, the medical field where you yeah, have to apply for certification. Yeah, yeah. I totally understand. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I have many more questions, but uh, we, we have to unfortunately move on. Um, so thank you very much again, Pietro, for giving this wonderful talk. Um, so thanks a lot. Yeah, thank for you. That. Thank you. And please be in touch and check the website, send me email, connect on LinkedIn, whatever, okay? And if I don't see you, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas, happy and, new year. And everything to you as well. And you see Alberto now here arriving, so. Yeah. It's, Ciao, it's, Alberto. It's, I think it's a fantastic transition from, oh, yeah. from, the, from the, the engineer to the, to the surgeon, uh, exactly the same field, colonoscopy. So thanks again to Pietro and welcome to Alberto. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.